in this very first session, we have low carbon growth and the development impact. As the theme, and there are three papers. As the debate on carbon emission took place about a quarter century ago, the developing countries in particular were very quick to point out that bulk of the emission, more than three quarters of it, <coughs> originates from the developed world. And somehow, that time possibly there was a feeling that the developing countries have time several decades to take action on the emission front. But as the new database and other details on the accounting of carbon emerged, it was clear that to the incremental carbon emission, the changes in the stock will. It is the developing countries that are contributing more. And it is for this reason that action needs to be taken independent of whether they agree to a binding commitment or not. Under the Indian environmental laws, we cannot tax the pollutants. They can tax only inputs and outputs. Unless the laws are amended, they have only choice of levying a tax on input. But we proposed a tax, the tax rate varying with the ash content. But in the last year budget, the finance minister announced a uniform rate of rupees 50 per ton, regardless of the quality of the coal, that are domestic or imported. We made a study of about 81 coal based thermal power plants in India in 2002 and of this 13 had an operational emissions of less than 25 percent about 40 between 20 to 35 percent and only 26 had a efficiency above 30 percent for 81 plants the coal consumption per kilowatt hour raised from 1.2 to 0.6 for the most efficient one CO2 emission also varied from 0.78 to 1.61 kg per kilowatt hour. There are also variations in the other pollutants, salts and so on. Not only this external cost of incorporating pricing, but the costing method is completely flawed. We still follow the whole historical cost, fully distributed cost accounting method. It does not affect the current margin cost of producing electricity. And also the measurement of subsidies and cross subsidies is completely wrong. The subsidy is calculated as a difference between the cost of produced selling power at the retail Indian sector with average cost for the system as a whole. That would ignore the transmission distribution cost at various stages. conducted a GIS-based research in Bangladesh to delineate vulnerable zone in coastal areas to larger storm surges and sea level rise in a changing climate by 2050. So this year is very much important in all our predictions because all our predictions of population, output, etc., etc., is tied to this time period. We have tried to estimate potential damage and we have tried to quantify adaptation cost. And as I pointed out before, our collaborators are uh, all in Bangladesh. Actually, they have done the heavy lifting and uh, we have just uh, collaborated with them, gave them some guidance and uh, uh, learned from the work experience. The methodology of the research was like five four fr from First, we were concerned about demarcation of potential vulnerable zone and projection of inundation depth from storm surges. Then we identified assets and activities exposed to inundation risk. 
then we computed potential damage and loss for a 10 year return period cyclone out to 2050. We identified existing adaptation measures and changes that will be required in a changing climate and then we costed the adaptation initiatives. Now, once again, when we go look through the historical cyclone tracks between 1960 through 2009, you can see very clearly that the entire coast of Bangladesh is prone to cyclone. And the damage from the most recent severe cyclone cedar in 2007 was more than 1.7 billion US dollars. Now, for demarcation of vulnerable zone, what we did is we started with a scenario, baseline scenario, scenario without climate change. And there we have considered 19 historical cyclone tracks with actual observed meteorological parameters. And for the climate change scenarios, we looked at five different cyclone tracks to span the entire coastline. <coughs> and one was artificial. For that artificial one, we looked, uh, we considered meteorological parameters <coughs> such as wind speed, radius of influence, etc. from CIDR. We considered 10% increase in during cyclone, in wind speed during cyclone in a changing climate, a conservative estimate of 27 centimeters sea level rise, and likely landfall of a cyclone during high tide. This is very important because depending on when a cyclone makes landfall during high tide or low tide, the damage differs very significantly. Isla made uh, landfall in Bangladesh in low tide, whereas cedar made landfall in high tide. Okay. Now as far as the uh, the no climate change scenario was concerned. Basically, we have a number of WHO studies that give some uh, scenario. They, they have developed some scenarios for the South Asia region, not India in particular, but for South Asia region. And we basically, uh, you know, took advantage of that available information to, to create these scenarios. Uh, and to the extent we can construct such scenarios for, for, for India, for specific countries, then that would mark an uh, advancement as far as, uh, you know, methodology is concerned. Uh, now, some of the key results that we got by following this methodology is that, you know, the additional annual adaptation costs for malaria, diarrhea and malnutrition under different scenarios of development are in the range of 171 to 546 million US dollars in the unmitigated scenario. And if you introduce mitigation, then there is a possibility of achieving approximately 15 to 18 percent of reduction in the estimated annual additional cost of adaptation. So mitigation, uh, in a mitigated scenario, we uh, have this kind of uh, an improvement as far as uh, adaptation costs are concerned. Of course, it depends on the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, development pathways that one is uh, assuming for, for the country and also the link between development and health outcomes, uh, the, the kind of assumptions that is going into, you know, how far uh, development would lead to uh, improvements on uh, uh, malarial incidence and uh, morbidity figures. Now, if we compare our estimates with the World Bank study, then these estimates are lower. Uh, World Bank study estimate was 850 million US dollars per year for malaria in the area. And, uh, uh, what seems to work for, uh, or what seems to account for this lower estimate is because of the introduction of uh, preventive measures. So once you, you know, introduce preventive measures and give a greater focus on the preventive measures, then you need not spend so much on the costlier reactive measures, the, the, the secondary and tertiary treatment measures. Um, but even then, you know, the a, 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 a estimate like uh, uh, something like you know 141 to 445 million US dollars per year that is still considerable when you compare it with the kind of health spending the public health spending that is happening in the in the, <coughs> in the region as a whole so that kind of gives a very strong message to the government that one has to really bring in some uh, some strong focus to to this sector if uh, we are to you know uh, not only meet the adaptation challenges, but also the kind of deficit that is that exists, the kind of an adaptation deficit, as they call call it, 
as it exists in, in, in these key sectors.